This Week on Oklahoma Horizon. Well, new aerospace jobs are landing in the state. We'll look at who's hiring and find out why work already underway helped an international aviation manufacturer choose the Sooner State. Throughout the career tech system, we strive to work with and build a relationship with companies to know exactly what their employee needs are going to be and what those skill sets are. And then we develop the curriculum specifically to meet those needs. Andy Barth takes us to a longtime Oklahoma electronics company whose work is about to be out of this world. We'll head down to the Oklahoma History Center to look at new exhibits on Oklahomans and the movies. Plus, we'll meet an Oscar and Emmy award-winning Oklahoman who makes the eerie look all too real. Stay with us for Oklahoma Horizon. Oklahoma Horizon is made possible by the Oklahoma Department of Career and Technology Education. Oklahoma's investment in career tech provides more than nationally recognized technology education and training. It produces solid financial returns for the state's economic future. Oklahoma Career Tech, elevating our economy. And the Oklahoma Department of Agriculture, Food, and Forestry, helping good people grow good things. And now, from the Career Tech Studios in Stillwater, here's your host, Rob McClendon. When boat engine builder Merck Cruiser closed its Stillwater manufacturing plant in 2010, it hit the town of 47,000 pretty hard. Nearly 400 people lost their jobs, and the city lost almost $2 million in sales tax. So when Governor Mary Fallon and Oklahoma Commerce Secretary Dave Lopez, attending an international air show in Farnborough, England, announced that ASCO Incorporated, a Belgian-based aerospace manufacturer, is going to reopen the shuttered plant and create about 600 new jobs, they could probably hear the cheers from Stillwater all the way across the Atlantic. We were in Stillwater as that announcement was being made about new aerospace jobs coming in to the Sooner State. Here's four months on the job and here we it's are. It's one of those announcements state leaders <laughs> love to make. Uh, it, is, it is a thrill for me to be here. 600 new skilled aerospace jobs heading to Stillwater. What is good for Stillwater is good for our entire state. Aircraft manufacturer ASCO is just the latest aerospace company to move to Oklahoma, joining 12 hundred others that already contribute more than twelve and a half billion dollars to the state's economy. Good news for Oklahoma and great news for a city that's seen several manufacturers close their doors. I think this is a defining game-changing announcement for Stillwater. It not only from an economic standpoint with the addition of jobs, but the type of jobs, but also on an emotional standpoint. I think this is John Bartley is mayor of Stillwater. I think it shows that we that Stillwater has rebounded and has recovered. We we lost jobs with the mer mercury leaving, but we've reevaluated and you, a focus on the aerospace. A new door is open, and we're taking advantage of it. And I and I can feel from the community how happy people are and the excitement behind it. The Belgian-based company will hire up to 600 employees beginning in September. It's first manufacturing plant in the U.S. This announcement could have happened absolutely anywhere. Anywhere. It's not by accident that it's in Stillwater. Thanks in part to a list of state and federal tax incentives. Stillwater Chamber of Commerce CEO Lisa Navrakal. So really just the incentives played a very key role for us. Uh, we were able to offer them the uh, federal incentive of the new market tax credits. As well as Oklahoma's quality jobs program, which gives companies a payroll tax rebate for creating new jobs that pay above the state average. State Representative Corey Williams. Well, they help us level the playing field with uh, the rest of our competitors, which unfortunately, you know, it's a global marketplace, and, and certainly domestically, it's a, we're competing on a state-by-state -state basis. So our ability to attract businesses depends a lot on what we can do through economic incentive and, and tax. Uh, you know, that's the one area that we can really control. And uh, so I think in this situation and in other situations that we've been involved with, they play an incredible role. So while the tax incentives may attract companies like ASCO to the state, for the long term, 
It's the training and learning laboratories like this that builds the workforce that keeps the companies here. We're going to do it in a couple of phases. We're going to take Rebecca Eastham is the business director at Meridian Technology Center. We're going to expand our facilities a bit and then offer additional times of training. So that's the first phase. The second phase then will be to add some short-term machining specifically for the aerospace industry. Again, we'll offer evening programs, weekend programs, and then working together with ASCO, we're going to look to set up a training center there on site that we can do some additional training. Work, Eastman says, will continue as the International Aerospace Company continues to grow in Stillwater. That's the, I think, the beauty of Career Tech. It doesn't end. Our technology center is here for a long-term partnership with any company, whether it's ASCO or any company coming into our uh, district. We love to build that long-term relationship. And I think, quite honestly, that was one of the attractive things for ASCO when we could tell a story that we were with Mercury Marine from the day they opened the door till the day they closed the door. And that's the relationship that we like to build with all the companies within our district, as do all technology centers across the state of Oklahoma. And I think that is just what makes the Oklahoma Career Tech System so unique, is that we are partners with industry. We love to find out what they've got going on, and we're going to tweak our curriculum to make sure we're getting them the skilled workforce that they need, not just to sustain their business, but to grow their business. Well, training for these new jobs could take from several weeks to a full year. But before that even happens, instructors at Meridian Tech will be traveling to Belgium to make sure they're teaching the skills the company needs. Just all in a day's work, according to the school superintendent, Doug Major. We know already that a lot of the skill sets that, that ASCO is going to require of its employees, that we have training developed for that. But we also know that we're going to have to develop some new areas, and, and we're excited about that because we're continuing to change as processes change. And so we're, uh, we're confident that in our CNC machining, in our quality control, uh, in our assembly programs, we're ready. A fact not lost on state lawmakers. Let's talk about career tech for a moment, significant economic impact and a huge recruiting tool for our state. I mean to say that we can train your employees better than anybody and if you happen to evolve your business or change your business or alter anything once you're here, we can quickly pick up, pick up the slack there and retrain your employees for anything that you want to do. Career tech was a huge, huge part of this announcement with ASCO and Stillwater, significant. Well, the average salary for our new jobs at ASCO will be right around $45,000 annually. The company says it will start interviewing as early as September and begin training shortly thereafter. Now, if you're interested or know someone that is, we have that toll-free number of the Oklahoma Employment Security Commission listed on our website, as well as a feature on the impact Oklahoma's quality jobs program has on recruiting such companies here into the state. Just head to OKRISEN.com and click on this week's value added. You're watching Oklahoma Horizon, featuring some of the good things that are happening in the great state of Oklahoma. Well, last year, Oklahoma aviation companies accounted for nearly four and a half billion dollars in exports all around the world. But one Oklahoma company is working on a project where the final destination is actually out of this world. Joining me now is our Andy Barth. Rob, the folks at Frontier Electronics understand what it means to soar to new heights. Their partnership with Boeing is one of the strongest in the business, including the International Space Station. And after a celebration where Frontier received several honors, that relationship grew even stronger. At Frontier Electronics Systems, they're reaching for the skies, setting records and expanding a reputation. We had produced and are prepared to deliver the 1,000th engine fuel display that we build for the Boeing F-18 Super Hornet. Brenda Rolls is the president of Frontier Electronic Systems and says the success of the engine fuel display isn't the only thing worth celebrating. We're also celebrating um, the Supplier of the Year Award from Boeing and this is really quite an amazing award. An award that not any company wins. Out of Boeing's roughly 28,000 suppliers, Frontier is one of 12 companies to receive this award. 
and for them, it's for the fourth time. And because of their past performance, Frontier received a significant, exclusive contract. The International Space Station was built with technology that was current at the time it was designed. And as the years have ticked by and the decades have ticked by, some of the technology needs to be upgraded. The program that we are going to be collaborating with Boeing Houston on controls the solar panels on the space station, and they are going to really rebuild the units that control the solar panels, and they are coming to Frontier as a single source supplier option to build the boxes that will help control the solar panels. In Boeing's F-18 programs, Vice President Mike Gibbon says, the relationship between Boeing and Frontier is very important. Frontier is a, is a critical partner for us. They build the engine fuel display, which is a vital component in the cockpit, in the uh, air vehicle crew interface uh, of the Super Hornet and the Growler for critical information about the engine state, about the fuel state. And we've partnered with Frontier because they bring two primary things that match perfectly with the whole value proposition of the Super Hornet and Growler. That is capability and affordability. Capability because the engine fuel display that they provide has uh, not only provides that information in a, in, a, in, a, in a state that is needed, but Frontier helped develop that and they've helped evolve that over time and they're continuing to help evolve that with the advanced crew station that we're currently working. Affordability because Frontier has worked to decrease the cost of that component to Boeing and therefore to the United States Navy customer uh, over time by over 65% since its inception. And these awards and recognitions mean good things for the state. The state of Oklahoma has demonstrated an interest and a commitment in developing and retaining technology jobs. And I applaud the state for that kind of initiative and for wanting to develop those kinds of positions. Um, so a company like Frontier and the awards that we receive today help bring business into our state economy. And one of the things about a company like Frontier in Oklahoma is most of our customers are not local. So we're bringing in revenue dollars from outside the state. Partnering with Small Town America to help protect our men and women in the air. Now Frontier expects to sign paperwork on the space station contract toward the beginning of next year and will start work on the project soon after. Now I don't want to ask you about the fuel engine displays. They seem to be pretty important. They are, Rob. They let the pilot know how much fuel the plane has and if they have to engage in combat, the pilot knows the fuel distribution so we can compensate for speed and agility. All right. Thank you so much, Eddie. You're welcome, Rob. Still to come on Oklahoma Horizon, putting the yuck into entertainment, but first, Oklahoma and the movies. Well, probably no state is better identified with a movie than Oklahoma, but our movie roots go well beyond that iconic musical Oklahoma and are featured at a new exhibit at the Oklahoma History Center. How closely tied is Oklahoma's history to that of the movies? Well, Oklahoma history, especially as a state, parallels the history of the movies. Uh, Thomas Alva Edison developed the movie camera in the 1890s. We know that he sent a crew to Oklahoma Territory in 1904. The earliest film shot in the state was an Edison crew who came in to shoot a little short on Indians fighting the cowboys. So the Indians ride into the scene and they attack the wagon and uh, go on and then the cowboys attack and there's a running battle and that's it. Uh, the first full length movie that's 87 minutes was 1920. Shot in the Wichita Mountains, 300 Kiowas and Comanches, Quanta Parker's son is the star called Daughter of Dawn. We have resurrected, restored, and we're now showing that movie. And then Oklahomans have been in the movie since the earliest days because cowboys and Indians were always part of movie industry. Well, we had the cowboys and the Indians. Ben Johnson, raised to be the perfect cowboy in Osage County, it learns to be a roper and rider and, and how to take care of himself. Well, he gets into the movies by 1941 and in Howard Hughes' movie as a wrangler, stays in Hollywood, uses his Oklahoma cowboy skills to be this great actor who won an Academy Award. Uh, but Tom Mix was a cowboy on the, at the 101 Ranch, as discovered by these filmmakers, goes to Hollywood. 
And then you have the American Indians, uh, starting with uh, Jim Thorpe was in over 60 movies while he lived in Los Angeles. And so the Indians would go to Hollywood to be in movies. Oklahomans would go to Hollywood. You can follow it all the way to today. Wes Studi, who grew up in No Fire Hala in the Cherokee Nation, did not speak English until the age of seven, becomes a star in the 1980s in Dances with Wolves. And of course, that great character of Magua in Last of the Mohicans and all of his other movies. And you get people like Ron Howard, whose great grandfathers on two sides of the family claim land in 1893 near Cost City. Rance, his dad, who was also an actor, grew up on the ranch, married another actress from Duncan. Ron Howard was born in Duncan, and then they get him into the movies because they have acting careers, and he makes movies including almost an autobiographical movie called Far and Away about an Irishman leaving Ireland and making the land run. That's his great-grandparent's story. We see Oklahomans behind the scene as producers and directors. Blake Edwards, who made all the Pink Panther movies, was from Tulsa. Uh, people are surprised that all of these Oklahomans, the sound editors, the, the editor for all of Lawrence Kasdan's movies, The Big Chill, Grand Canyon, Carol Littleton from Miami, Oklahoma, edited all of those movies. And so Oklahomans have been involved behind the camera, on the screen, producing, the publicists, the people who make the business. There's a very strong Oklahoma flavor in the history of movies. And in this 8,000 square foot exhibit, we try to tell that story by telling the stories of the Carol Littletons and the Ben Johnsons and the Blake Edwards and the, the Rex Lins and the people who have made film history. And while all of these people have very noted careers, is there one person that you can point to that probably was the most popular Oklahoman in the movies? The top grossing star in the movies was Will Rogers. He was the very top actor. He would have been the Tom Cruise uh, De Niro of his day. He was only supplanted in his last year of movies by a new actress called Shirley Temple. And so, but Will Rogers had been the top grossing movie star in Hollywood in 1931, 32, 33. And so he was at the top. He was a nationally known character. He was known around the world, the champion of the common man. He had uh, newspaper columns. He had radio shows. He appeared with presidents, with senators. He was a popular speaker. This man was king of popular culture. And so we have on exhibit here two artifacts from Will Rogers. Uh, career. We have the Confederate jacket that he wore in Judge Priest, where he played this ex-Confederate who's now a judge. Will Rogers' dad, Clem, was a member of the uh, Indian Home Guard of the Confederates who fought during the Civil War. That's part of his personal history. We also have a medieval jacket that he wore in a Connecticut Yankee in King Arthur's Court, and then other artifacts from those movies. So we tell that story, but we have Probably the actor who has the most stuff in the exhibit is Ben Johnson because he was a real cowboy. His dad was a real cowboy, the foreman of the Chapman Barnard Ranch in the Osage. We have his shaps, his saddle, his hats. We have his stories. We have footage of him wrangling horses, of talking to people and being the cowboy. We have footage of Ben. We have his, his uh, stunt man bag that he'd carry his gear in. We have his, his awards, we have his Golden Globe, we have his scripts, uh, we have uh, costumes, we have stuff. We have John Wayne's shirt that he wore in the movie The Searchers, which is an Oklahoma story where the Parkers go after Cynthia Ann Parker, who's been kidnapped by the Comanches. Well, that movie is based on that story. We have that shirt, and we show scenes of the movie with John Wayne wearing the shirt that's on exhibit here. So we have lots of artifacts, lots of stories, and people will have shared memory. So as we talk about Ben Johnson in the last picture show, people will go back to when they saw the last picture show. When we talk about the writer who wrote the screenplay for Bridge Over the River Kwai, mm -hmm. this was an Oklahoman who was blacklisted. And you see his Oscar with a black hood over the head of the Oscar because that symbolized his attitude about being blacklisted. We have that black hood on that Oscar. So we'll take people back to when they saw Shane in Three Oklahomans starring in that movie. Ben Johnson, Alan Ladd lived in Oklahoma City. Van Heflin grew up in Oklahoma City. So that's an Oklahoma all-star cast in one movie, Shane. That's 
arguably one of the greatest Westerns of all time. And so people can share their own personal history with their families, their parents, their kids, their grandkids, and come and have a, a real family experience and, and see the artifacts, see how Oklahomans have been part of shaping the image of America through the art of movies. Now Dr. Blackburn tells me that one of the most distinctive voices ever heard on the silver screen is that of an Oklahoman. If you'd like to find out who it is, just head to OKRISON.com and click on this week's Value Added. Oklahoma Horizon is now portable. Just subscribe to our weekly podcast. Visit iTunes.com where you can download our show for your listening or viewing convenience. Well, while one-time Oklahomans like Brad Pitt may be a household name, other Oklahomans making a great living out in Hollywood aren't exactly. So when it comes to making movie magic, probably no one does it any better than a Toke Oklahoma's very own Academy Award winner, Matthew Mungle. And while you may not know the name, you have seen his work. Come on in, I'll show you the House of Horrors. You may know Oklahoman Matthew Mungle so by his work on popular TV parts. shows. Heads, bodies that we use on episodes of CSI, NCIS, House, uh, Criminal Minds. A Hollywood makeup artist, Mungle credits early horror movies for sparking his interest in movie makeup. Around 1965, 64, 65, Seven Faces of Dr. Lau came out with Tony Randall. And I was amazed at how his his appearance changed in the movie, not knowing that he had shaved his head at that time. And how did they actually get his character to look like that? And that's what really got me involved in makeup. And then, of course, in 1968, Planet of the Apes came out. So that was all she wrote, you know, right there. So Mungle bought the Richard Corson stage makeup book and taught himself makeup techniques. And the rest, as they say, is history. What we have to do is we have to take a face cast of the actor, and once that's done, then we have to duplicate it in silicone so it looks just exactly like the actor so we can make them look dead or alive. Um, we have to cut their head off. We have to cut their arms off like this body here. And if you look at them really close, you can see that all of the hairs are punched in one at a time eyelashes, sideburns, everything. It's very time consuming. At 56, Mungle says he still loves to do the art of makeup. That's what I really enjoy doing, is making, doing a makeup so that it really can, totally fools the audience. Like we, for Schindler's List, we had to take the eight principal women and basically make them look like they'd have their head shaped. And that's what really intrigues me. And it's just still, every job is so creative. And his art is rewarding. Winning the Academy Award was obviously one of the highlights of my career. I didn't get into this business saying, okay, I'm, I'm gonna win an Academy Award, Emmy Awards. It, you know, it was about the passion for me of doing this. And winning the Academy Award was just amazing. It was just, oh, okay, I've kind of arrived. Oklahoma creativity at work, helping to keep our entertainment realistic and amazing. Well, while Matthew Mungle had to gain his expertise out on his own, young people interested in special effects makeup now have the ability to hone their craft while still in school. Students in Oklahoma's Career Tech's cosmetology program compete in an event called Fantasy Makeup that lets them turn the ordinary into the extraordinary. The reason we've gotten into that is simply because there is no vehicle for facial artists other than going to Hollywood to learn the next level of skill in makeup. Well, hopefully that's what this will start so that we have a vehicle from normal makeup into movies. Well, fantasy makeup is just one event offered through the Skills USA competition that allows students to compete for scholarships and prizes. And since the fantasy makeup event was started in Oklahoma in 2005, 
Its popularity has helped it grow into a national competition. Now, if you'd like to see more about Matthew Mungle or the Fantasy Makeup Program, just head to our website at okhorizon.com and click on this week's value add. If you're interested in Oklahoma culture, you can keep up with us throughout the week on the Red Dirt Chronicles blog. Look for the On the Horizon postings on Tuesdays and Fridays and tell us what you think. Next time on Oklahoma Horizon, for a state known for its rolling plains, Oklahoma is home to some beautiful forest land. We'll take you to southeastern Oklahoma to look at an industry and a way of life. I think one of the most unique things that uh, we can talk about in southeast Oklahoma is how uh, forestry and tourism coexist. You know, we've got this fabulous, vast forest. On Oklahoma Show for the Heartland, Oklahoma Horizon. Well, we are out of time. I'm Rob McClendon. Thanks for watching. See you back here next week.